uh, get moving forward here. I know everyone's interested in hearing what their items might be worth. So we'll start off with this one and I'll uh, we'll go, go to a couple pictures. So this um, bin um, was described as a coal bin and it may have held, held coal. They also, um, similar ones were used in country stores and held uh, tea. Uh, so they're used for tea bins and sometimes in country stores. And this one's been uh, painted on um, its, uh, so it wasn't this way uh, initially. The light looks like later paint. And he has a nice side view, but, but the, it's kind of a nice uh, folk art painting on it. The back. And you can see, this gives you some perspective. You can see a uh, person's legs in there. They're, this is, these are pretty good size, probably about uh, two feet high. And uh, there's another view, but but the painting's kind of kind of nice on it. Um, sometimes, if it uh, were an advertising piece for for tea, it would be a little more valuable if you had the original uh, tea graphics on it. But this is uh, still a nice decorative piece, um, and I, I think in this condition, uh, uh, it would be about a hundred dollars. And, and I should have mentioned. Um, so, so as I give it a little bit about appraisals, uh, so you may have, those of you who watch the Antique Roadshow maybe hear different prices. It could be an auction price. It could be um, insurance uh, price when they get, uh, offer an appraisal. Uh, I, I'll use those and sometimes I'll, um, I may say this is what I might sell for in an antique shop to a, kind of a reasonable price in a, in a shop. So they may, they may vary a little, uh, maybe a little different. Insurance appraisal is typically the highest because that's a replacement value. And um, we're, we're uh, to do a uh, formal appraisal, um, I, I typically see everything in person. I am um, able to flip things over, look, look them over better. And um, we have to do uh, run comps on them to uh, meet use PAP standards, which are the uh, appraisal standards. And we're not going to do that in this. This is more uh, just to give you a general idea. So, um, if you uh, if you did need insurance appraisal, you could get a, you could get uh, one uh, from either me or another uh, appraiser. But um, this is just these appraisals are more to give you a general idea. And um, uh, so, with, with that being said, this would be about a hundred dollars in a shop. Okay, and this is a uh, steel engraving. It's, it's hand colored. It's a scene in Paris. There's some writing that was on it. Um, maybe the artist's signature. And it says it's a steel etching. And um, so steel etchings, or let's, steel engra uh, engravings were later. Uh, first, they were made with wood blocks, but you could only make so many uh, engravings with a, with a wood block before the wood started to, uh, get wear. And so uh, you, uh, wood, wood blocks only allowed you so many uh, uh, printings. Then they switched to uh, copper and copper was stronger, it lasted longer. And then eventually uh, you used steel and with the steel, there was very little wear and you could make uh, th thousands of these uh, engravings or etchings. And this one looks to be hand colored. It's a, it's a scene in Paris and it says uh, Paris at Christmas time. And, and I, I did uh, a little research. That's one, one thing I'm able to do where I can't do at a typical appraisal event. Um, so I was able to do a little homework on some of these pieces. And um, I found uh, the only other one I could find from Paris, and there were multiple ones, were of Notre Dame. And those were selling for about uh, $25. So I think this maybe a little bit more on this because it's a little more, more unusual. So maybe 35, 40. And uh, here's a pair of lamps and uh, they were um, just, if we uh, push, go a little further, it's, uh, you can see that it's by L and F Moreau and it's M-O-R-E-A-U, who was a, um, a, a French sculptor and he, best known for bronze cast, bronze cast figures. And, and um, if we go a little further, you can see it's a 
collection Francais uh, made in USA. And, and these were made by a company, uh, J.B. Hirsch. So they're not um, original Moreau's. If you had one of those, you'd be in, um, multiple thousands of dollars. Uh, but but the, the, he was a very popular artist and a lot of his pieces were reproduced. So these lamps uh, were as well. And we're gonna go back again just to part where the, so you can see, uh, I looked up some um, comps on these and didn't find a lot with those glass shades on, on them. So th that's um, it's, uh, it's kind of nice to see them with the original sh shades. The, these aren't, um, these are 20th century somewhere uh, copies, but they're still pretty desirable. I've, I found some selling online for in the, uh, the pair that was closest to this sold for $300. And here's a, a couple of Courier, Courier Knives prints. And uh, Courier Knives, um, I just again noted a few things um, that produced some of the most popular wall hangings of the 19th century. And Courier set up the print shop in 1834 and was joined by Ives in 1952 and became, Ives became a partner in 1857. So, um, uh, antiques markets changed a lot. I've been doing this over 30 years and um, there just doesn't, in many areas, there just isn't the interest there used to be, unfortunately. And um, but so courier knives have slipped a little bit, but the good news is that um, Civil War memorabilia is still very collectible. So there are collectors for Civil War era. And courier knives haven't, um, the value hasn't dropped com completely, but they, they used to, I, I might've said, 20 years ago that they might be 300 each, but now I look them up and um, I, I found four prints by Courier Knives that sold for 350. So that these being two, you'd be at around 175. The only thing is uh, I think on one, you could see a little bit of staining on the bottom. And so that'll make it drop a little bit. So maybe 125 or 150 for the, pair on these. Uh, and uh, next thing is a uh, Joe DiMaggio baseball card. And it's by a company called um, Playball, which is made by, as you can see, it was made by Gum Inc. And it's a 1939 card. Baseball cards are an area that's remained uh, very hot. There's some of some prices, um, prices really haven't changed a lot on these. They're uh, still very desirable. But uh, as the person who sent it in noted, you can see there's some creasing on the card and that makes a big difference. Um, you can see uh, actually going through um, the left side of his face, there's kind of a big crease. So um, with baseball cards, there are companies that do grading and you can get them graded if you have a star and it's in very good condition and it may be worthwhile because the difference between um, a card that's made, they'll grade them one through 10, by the way. So a card that's uh, three versus a seven could be thousands of dollars. So it may be uh, worth uh, doing. Th this one, because of the crease, the value isn't going to, um, has, is, isn't, um, you know, top of the scale, but because I've seen other ones sell for um, eight eight thousand in that range, but they were maybe eight nine uh, grade cards. This one would be a lot lower, but still think you'd be in the four hundred dollar range or so on that one. And here's a um, person described as a uh, sea chest uh, ships ships made sea chest. And it says it was um, uh, John Lewis Turney, and, and that the name is, uh, uh, there's also some initials. So um, take a look at that. Uh, you got the old iron hardware, so that all looks good. Uh, natural wear you would see with it. And, and the paint on it too, I should have noted, is looks to be original. It's got a, Oh yeah, one go back one more time. You can see the rope handle. That's something you'd expect to see as well. Um, the, 
The uh, design in the front, um, I have to be a little skeptical being uh, in uh, dealing, being an antique auctioneer and I've seen a lot of people try to uh, alter things a little bit. So I, I'd like to see that close up just to be sure that it's, uh, that's original to it. Um, it there's, a, there's a chance that it, it may not be uh, because um, it's, Another thing is uh, I like to know if things have been passed down through the family. In this case, it was uh, purchased at, um, at, at a, an antique shop. So you never know what could have happened along the way. And again, the in, inside looks good. You've got uh, iron on top and uh, natural wear. So, um, on, on that, I, I found some comps for uh, similar similar C chess, and they were um, one sold for two hundred and fifty. Nineteen sixties hand painted and signed Catherine Hennick uh, French provincial pedestal table, and uh, it was their first married gift in nineteen sixty two, and uh, looked into Catherine Hennick a, a little and got, dug up some information. Uh, she and her husband, Ozias, ran a furniture factory in South Boston. Catherine was born in 1900 and died in uh, 1993. And um, they, uh, they emigrated from Romania and lived in Boston. And this piece, I found a similar one that sold for $225. As we go through it a little bit, you can see her signature there. So that's... Uh, Sign piece, and that's what that was. An um, older appraisal that 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 was from two thousand and three, and I have to note that the market uh, as does change a lot. So it's uh, going with a two thousand and three appraisal that you might uh, you typically adjust it downward a bit, but just to give you an idea of what they sold for in the past. And, and this this one um, is a table, the nineteenth century, and it says it was likely uh, fashioned from a ship's door. So we'll get some other views of this one. And then the, the age again looks right. The painting on the bottom uh, looks a little newer to me. So it looks like it um, may have been, um, if they call, it, call it upcycling or repurposed, whereas some uh, work was done on it. And so they made the ship's door into a nice little table. So. It, it's a, a unique piece and it certainly has eye appeal and I'm sure uh, someone would be interested. It's just uh, the kind of thing you're not going to find any comps on because it's kind of a one of the kind piece. So, so um, I did look and try to find something kind of in the ballpark and found uh, some tavern tables that were in the two $300 range. And I think uh, this might also be in that range. And um, this one is a um, uh, ironstone, and it's uh, was mar it's marked. It says uh, Edward uh, President Edward's President shape on the bottom. Uh, no, excellent when done. No chips or cracks. So um, again, after uh, doing a little work, um, found that. Uh, John Edwards and Company uh, made china and earthenware in Longton and then Fenton in, in England. And um, the, the present shape uh, stamp was used for just a short period of time. It was from 1873 to 1879. So we can uh, get these dated pretty accurately. Uh, a bowl with a cover on uh, this one, you can see doesn't have one, sold for $50 uh, fairly recently and the teapot uh, went for $70. And these are uh, auction prices I'm giving you too, just so you, so you know, on, on, uh, so pretty much on everything, unless I tell you, I mentioned that it's, I, my source is different. And, and this um, says that it's um, uh, Wedgwood pieces and they say 1775 and 1776, uh, excellent condition, no chips or cracks. And, and um, I'm going to uh, assume that it's marked Wedgwood because all uh, Wedgwood would, would be marked. 
And um, so they, these are dip, uh, usual patterns. You usually don't see uh, f- flowers on it. And um, often see it with cameo designs and that's called Jasper Ware. And so this looks to be a Jasper Ware, but, but um, if, if it, so let's go with the, assume that it is uh, Wedgwood and I've seen similar pieces bring a uh, hundred dollars each if they are uh, fairly large. If that's a creamer and a sugar, it's going to be a lot smaller. So you're looking at maybe 75 for the uh, pair. But if, um, if it doesn't have that Wedgwood mark, it's not Wedgwood because the factory did mark everything. They were proud of their workmanship. So you can um, just double check that whoever this belongs to. And here's an, uh, an old butter churn. And um, so uh, it's a it called a dash or a plunge, plunge to type. And so it's probably from the late 1800s. And uh, ones like it's similar ones sell in the two hundred dollar range on on that. Uh, this uh, painting I uh, signed E. J. Condren, nineteen twenty two. So if you have paintings at home, you can look up the artist and see there are databases you can go to. Some of them may charge you. Um, you can also go uh, pick up Davenport's art guide and you can find out what some paintings have sold for. And that's a really good source. I did that, use that all the time before I, I got my uh, data, signed up for a database online. But I looked up uh, E.J. Condren and there are some other Condrens, but uh, no E.J. So looks like E.J. wasn't a uh, listed artist, but, but it's kind of an, uh, has nice uh, eye appeal. It's a little, uh, kind of uh, folk art, permit, permanent design on it. And I, um, I don't know the age. If you, can, if you do have a painting, if you can flip it over and look at the back, you can t- usually tell by the amount of wear on it if, if it's a canvas. If it's look, still looking pretty bright, it's a pretty new one. But in this case, it's marked 1922, so that's just more, more of a tip. And the 1922 seems accurate, especially from the frame. And, and um, so it, it's, it's just uh, it's decorative, we'll say, because we don't have any information on the artist. But I think it has a nice look, and someone might ask 200 in an antique shop. And, and this uh, vase is marked Eaton Hand Painted China. And that's, so this is um, 20th century. And uh, I've looked at comps on these and they sell for around uh, $2,500 for floral ones like this. And a uh, person described this as flash glass, uh, which uh, looks to be, there's um, a lot of glass in the early 1900s. This looks a little, um, Later than that, but it was uh, it was uh, ruby flash glass was a type of glass that was used, and it was used in a lot of souvenirs pieces. Um, so what they would do is t- uh, take a piece of glass. A lot of times it was pressed glass in the early 1900s, and they put a coating of red on it uh, and or ruby, and then uh, they would etch uh, pieces out. So the uh, underlying clear glass would show up after it was dipped in the ruby. And that's what looks like happened here with this glass. It was, looks like it was um, uh, clear glass coated with that, that red color and then uh, etched to give it that nice uh, pattern. And that's, that's about um, $25 for that. If, if you do have any of the souvenir pieces, some can be pretty desirable. And uh, if you have rarer ones from towns that, um, didn't get a lot of tourists. If you have one from New York, probably not as valuable, but um, if you have one from Townsend, it's probably gonna have a lot more lo- local uh, appeal and uh, sell for more, be more valuable. There's some close-ups of the work. And uh, clocks are, um, ha- have uh, dipped a bit over the years, but th- this one's kind of nice. Some things to look for are, um, First to see what it's made of, and this looks like a wood case. They a lot of times this color may be slate, but it's um, from the photograph it looks looks like it's wood. Uh, but it's pretty pretty ornate. 
Um, you can see the dial, uh, the detail went into that and the workmanship on the side. And uh, so, so that, that's a nice looking clock. And, and you can see there's a close up of the dial again. More close ups. And so it, it looks like there's no damage to it. It looks to be in nice condition. And here's uh, some interesting information. A uh, person uh, noted that it was purchased in 1898 and uh, talked about how it's saying on the hour and uh, it's, it's runs, may gain speed. And it's uh, made by Sessions Company, which uh, we can see here, the Sessions Clock Company in Forestville, Connecticut. And most of the clocks that you see are going to be, be made by uh, in Connecticut. Connecticut uh, was a big clock making center. So um, uh, a, lot, a lot of the clocks from the 19th century were manufactured in Connecticut. Oops. So with this one, I did some comps. And again, again I've, uh, prices have dipped a bit. So this one, uh, I saw a similar one that brought it a little over $100. Uh, here are some uh, Eubank dolls from uh, Han Hannibal, Missouri, and uh, look them up. I, I, I didn't find uh, these, which are uh, Tom Sawyer and Becky Thatcher, but I found uh, uh, Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn in similar condition, and they brought uh, $50. Uh, dolls are, um, for the most part, are I've uh, also dipped a bit, and I said, probably tell you some of the things afterwards that uh, are, have increased in value, but uh, these dolls have dropped a little bit. And okay, and here are some uh, advertising fans and uh, just a um, person shared that they were uh, church fans from our his or her dad's church decor decorated with paintings on one side, advertisements on the other reverse, pro probably mid-century and the mid-century seems to be right on target. Uh, they seem to be from the from the 50s. So they have, um, the, the graphics are, they aren't painted, but they are copies of paintings. There they are uh, pulled apart. And there's the advertisement on the back. Uh, one's from Panama City, Florida, another one from Shelby, Nebraska, and Gen Geneseo, Illinois. I'm not sure on the pronunciation on that, but these uh, for this era, era, era typically, typically bring in about $10 each, but there could be something rare. Or there might be somebody um, in maybe, again, Shelby, Nebraska may not be a very, uh, uh, place that produced a lot, uh, many advertising pieces, and like again, like Boston or New York, you're going to find plenty of pieces from from there. But a smaller town, and maybe have a little more value. But typically, uh, ten dollars each on those. Here, here's a uh, some red wing pottery, and uh, person uh, says it's about fourteen inches tall, and it was a gift from uh, from their grandma. And you can see the red wing marking. When, when you have things at home, you can, you can do some of the uh, research uh, on your own. You can uh, tr try to uh, look look up red wing and try to find sim similar pieces. This one uh, uh, has, a, has a nice uh, drip glaze where the yellow meets with the green. Oops, and I'm gonna pass it, but, but um, so if, again, did a little, uh, background work on this and um, it's so uh, we Red Wing first of all was a Minnesota company and it was founded in 1861 and similar pieces to this uh, are in the 50 to 100 dollar range. Here's uh, Madame Alexander it was a, a popular uh, doll company in Alice in Wonderland. So there's um, you can see the condition on it's uh, very good. Uh, it says uh, persons uh, shared that it was uh, owned by their uh, grandma, purchased 
in Wichita, Kansas, uh, 1939. And the price then was 495 plus 10 cents for tax. But again, you can see that uh, there's, I think they noted that there's an issue with one of the eyes, but um, overall, look, you can see the condition is very nice, nice on that. And it also says that the wig is made of human hair and that, that their uh, eye may have been repaired at one point. So then there's, they've got the original tag, the condition on it's good. And I mentioned that uh, dolls uh, prices have dropped, but um, in, in this case, it's such a nice doll that the value I think is still still gonna be there and the collectors are gonna want this. I saw a um, similar one without a box that sold for 425 in, uh, in 2018. And, um, this, in this case, uh, I think it could bring 600 with the, with the box now. Wow. Here's a German cup and saucer. And uh, so three, three things uh, that, the mar again, the market's weak on. Uh, they call it brown furniture. It, it's um, just not selling well. Uh, glass in China, porcelain also, I should add. But unfortunately, this would have sold um, for uh, much, much more be, before. Um, now in a shop, you might see it for $25 and that might even be a little on the high side. It's, it's a probably, you know, it looks to be 100 years old, uh, but they're just, they're just not buying many buyers, unfortunately. And here, here's, um, the stand that uh, it's stood on. It's, that's made by our adult in Japan. And that's um, later in the 20th century. I've s seen them online for around $20. So um, next one, let me dig out, the, dig out some information on that. And it is, um, some puzzles, they, they, and the person says they're stave puzzles. They're all complete in the original boxes, and they're interested to know if they have any value. So here you can see it says uh, Tropical Punch 2. I assume these are, uh, it's, they're all three are Tropical Punch. There's an article on stave puzzles. Uh, made date 1999, made in Norwich, Vermont. So these were a little out of my wheelhouse, a little uh, new for type of things I usually handle. So I had to do a little research on these and um, uh, is what I found out. That um, company was formed in 1974 by Steve Richardson and Dave Tibbetts. So I guess with uh, Steve and Dave, they became Stave. And it's and I saw that uh, someone recently online had sold all three puzzles together, and they were six hundred dollars. So things don't necessarily have to be old to be valuable. And in this case, um, these three puzzles are worth about six hundred. And with this one, it's um, a person person picked these up in Grenwell, Labrador. Uh, it says. Uh, Labrador Eskimo and his lady, and they pick them up. It says an industrial sales room at St. Anthony, St. Anthony, part of the Greenfell mission. Uh, some other information, the material of the Dickey and Parker are, are Grenfell cloth, which is wind and water resistant, and the fur is real seal skin. They came with a small set of snowshoes purchased in 1939 in Labrador, and the original price for the man was $4 and the woman was $3.50. So I um, did, did some research on these and I know I said earlier that um, dolls don't have a lot of value, but it seems like uh, folks have some of the better ones uh, that are the ones that are, do have more value. And um, I don't know who these are, but I they, they, that looks like paper mache to me. And I'm gonna assume it is. Um, so if it isn't, you um, can let me know, but uh, so I, I I found some of the dolls from there were bringing two hundred dollars, but some of the paper mache ones could be uh, in, could actually be in the th low thousands. 
you get conditions not perfect, but so you know, maybe, but a rough estimate if it, if that those are paper mache is you're in the thousand range, and it has the little snowshoes with it, and there are the tags. Okay, so yeah, I'm here there. I gotta have to be the bearer of bad news about brown furniture. And that's a beautiful cherry set. And if this were 20 years ago, I would say at an estate sale, you, they might ask six, $800 for it. But now the market has just fallen so much that um, a lot of people are just donating them. Um, wow. Yeah. You know, um, now, now in an estate sale, you, you, they, you, and someone might ask three, four hundred dollars, and uh, but unfortunately, there's an article that Forbes did um, called "Nobody Wants Your Parents' Stuff," and the <laughs> pro problem is that um, there's so many people who are downsizing. There are so many, so much of material like this coming from decedent estates that the supply is through the roof and the demand is very small. Um, a lot of uh, people, especially, especially younger people don't like traditional furniture and um, this doesn't uh, have the appeal it once did. And um, so here we've got uh, Charlie McCarthy and Mortimer Snurd and um, person notes that Charlie has a pull string that can open and close his mouth and it's part of um, their uh, fiance's grandmother's doll collection. So, so um, things change and they, they uh, kind of fall out of favor. When I started doing this, Things like Roy Rogers lunchboxes, um, uh, Hopple on Cassidy, all the uh, Shirley Temple uh, toys from that era were, were popular, but now um, younger collectors aren't, aren't going to know who those people are. So the market uh, values on some of these have dropped a lot because uh, a lot people just aren't collecting that. They, they want to collect thing, toys from their youth. So things like uh, Transformers from the 90s are popular as opposed to um, Charlie McCarthy and Mortimer Snurd. But, but the condition on this is uh, fantastic. Uh, Charlie, Charlie really uh, looks good. Still got, has the original uh, button. You can see there, and it's made by a company called F and B, which I'll talk a little bit more about. We have another F and B uh, doll coming up later. So yeah, you, you can see again the condition is uh, very very good on these, and uh, but um, again the, the, because they've fallen out of favor a little bit, um, the uh, uh, let me just get, I found one, uh, it was a few years ago that a Charlie McCarthy sold for 350 and just recently Mortimer Snurr went in January, went for $55. And here's uh, uh, another doll and this, this one's an, an F&B. Mm -hmm. And um, so a little background on F&B company. It was founded by Bernard uh, Fleischiger and Hugo Baum in New York during 1912. So the F and the B became F and B and they just spelled it out E-F-F-A-N-B-E-E. -E. And the uh, company uh, uh, made nice dolls, but the doll, the doll market has has dipped. And um, But it is nice that we, we just saw the original box and that's gonna make a big difference. So you, with the with the box, you're looking at uh, maybe fit, uh, fifty to one hundred dollars. And and these are old timer covered wagons. And uh, I looked online uh, for these again, did a little research, and it looked like they're miniatures. And I assume these are as well. The only ones I could find from uh, were miniatures, and they were bringing in the ten to twenty dollar range. All right, uh, furniture, here we go, go again. I got a 
I'll let you know the bad news. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, this looks to be, uh, it doesn't look like a piece that's early enough to be uh, something that um, a craftsman would have handcrafted. It looks uh, like it's um, manufactured. And um, so $35 on, on that. Um, and here we've got a watch and let's look at the information that the person gave us on that. It's a, it's a lady's pocket watch blocked to my great grandmother, um, great grandmother who lived from 1851 to 1900 and immigrated to the U.S. from Sweden in 1872. And it's believed to be a wedding gift. And the, the script inside says um, uh, cylinder, I'll do the, their uh, English uh, translation for Ruby's movement, Swiss watch. So, uh, the rubies are our jewels. So the more, if you have a pocket watch at home, you wanna see how, how many uh, jewels there are. The more jewels in it, the more accurate it's gonna be, especially a later watch. Uh, so they might, you might see 17, 19, 21, 23. 23 would be the most accurate. Uh, you, there's other things you can do. Uh, if you look up the company, say it's a Waltham watch, you can uh, find out the serial number and you can find out, look up the serial number and find the date. So if you have watches at home, you can research them. Things to, other thing to look for is if it's made out of, uh, what the case is made out of gold uh, would be the best, of course. Uh, a lot of times they were made out of uh, gold, they were gold plated or made out of real gold, which is partial gold. It might, might be um, uh, just a percentage of gold in it or in sometimes silver. Uh, so in this one, Got some nice close-ups and the inside of the back is nice to see. And that's, and you can see the, where it's quattro rubies. It's uh, again, four jewels. Oops. So I'm just going, um, so if it's, if it's silver, which I didn't see it is, uh, then you're probably looking at around a uh, hundred dollars uh, for it. Um, and uh, otherwise it's, it would be a little less than that, maybe half. Uh, here's an um, interesting piece. And I, I guess it was a little hard to tell from the pictures and uh, let's see, get the person's description first of all. Uh, Seems to be from the 20s or 30s. Uh, Cartier block marking is also from that time, I believe. Maybe Art Deco era. And, and uh, it says that Cartier does not do authentication or appraisals. So I'm not, not sure where else to go to get info. Mm -hmm. So there's some things that you can do uh, on your own. And um, one um, is to just to see that it's, um, it's, it's uh, you could bring it to a jeweler and find out the, the stone, look at, have them look at the stones, see what you've got for, uh, it looks, they look, certainly look to be diamonds there and uh, get the pearl evaluated. And you can get a rough idea on the value from, uh, from the jeweler. And, and I, think, I think you're uh, right on target with the 20s to 30s. This does look to be an Art Deco piece. And, and here on the back, we've got some numbers um, and, and with a watch, a Cartier watch, and again with pocket watches, you can look up those numbers and find out a lot of information, uh, including the year that it was produced. So uh, with this, I assume you could as well. And um, from the picture, I, it, it doesn't say here, but it looks like a pendant. Uh, and that's what I'm guessing it is. Uh, but. Um, someone wants to correct me on that later. I'm happy to hear, but um, just from the pictures, that's what it looked like to me. But but that will at least give you some idea. I, I think that number is going to be a big help to you, and when as you do some research, and you can go to websites and and find out that information, and also again bring it to a jeweler, you'll be able to find out total carat weight if we're looking to find out value along with that. Um, more information about it. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I always like um, old advertising, and this is kind of kind of interesting. Instead of getting your shoes in a shoe box, you get them in a shoe tin. And the, uh, things to look for, the graphics look really good. You see a little bit of, uh, of uh, wear on the bottom, but for the most part, the condition is uh, pretty nice, normal wear you'd expect inside. Some uh, good uh, graphics on, on the box. And um, what else? let's see. So a close up. That's nice. People like advertising and uh, it always seems to sell pretty well. I've, I found um, a number of these and um, one in rougher con condition um, sold for $25 in 2016. But I think this one would um, bring over that. You might be looking at um, three times that amount. And, and the Worcester Chemical Fire Pail, so which is uh, local to me, um, right outside of Worcester, is uh, kind of interesting. And I and uh, so I look, looked it up, and they they don't don't look to be very common. I only found uh, one other one when I was looking through comps, and um, and the other one was in uh, much rougher shape. This one isn't perfect, uh, but the other one was even worse condition, and. Um, even the, the one in rough condition uh, brought $50 in 2012. So I, I think this is, I think this is kind of scarce and uh, could maybe bring 200 to the right person. And this one um, is a tin and let's take a look all the way through it. It's person notes that it's kidney shaped and um, marking on it is see the back and it even has some kind of uh, strap and uh, it's marked uh, FJ Boardman MPS Pharmacist Ab Abigail. So it's uh, UK, so, uh, so something we typically don't see around here. So I'm not really sure what the pharmacist would have done with it if they were dispensing things on the street or, uh, <laughs> or what the reason was to carry a kidney shaped tin rim with a strap on it. But it's, it's, it's kind of interesting, has a nice look to it. Couldn't find any uh, direct comps, but I, I, I think um, you're, all, you're probably at about $50 on that. That's a nice look. And uh, so here's a wine press and it said um, it, uh, uh, came from the great grandfather, father from Calabria, Italy, and the guy came in 1902 to the U.S. with his brothers um, through Boston to Morristown, New Jersey, to Indiana, to Miners Hill, Pennsylvania, Carbondale, Pennsylvania. 1921 moved to New Jersey, so a lot of traveling in, in the U.S. It's, uh, it says it's at least 70 years old, and that um, they remember a um, person. The um, uh, person's dad remembers it since he was alive and probably around 100 years old. And uh, they also know, which is kind of interesting, that the family's wine press is featured in Smith's, another, another family's, other, other, their other wine press is featured in the Smithsonian's exhibit on foods in America. So I, I did look, uh, look them up, um, wanted to find out um, what wine presses sold for, but I wanted to try to find one that was uh, from Italy, like I assume th this is. Uh, the family immigrated in 1929, and they say it's over 100 years old, so that would mean that came from Italy as well. And um, so I, uh, I found another one that's similar that sold for 325 in 2014. And, and I think the 100 years sounds about right from viewing the pictures. Uh, and this, this one's uh, uh, Beethoven Concerto, and it's um, signed uh, on the interior by the uh, conductor, Colin Davis. Let's see if we can see the signature. Yeah, you can see the signature up top. And um, so if you have uh, signatures of 
uh, somebody famous, you can get those uh, authenticated. Sometimes it's worth worth to pay for it. If it's somebody who's uh, whose autographs really d- desirable, if you, if you've got a George Washington or Babe Ruth, it may be worth having it authenticated, and then your value could be. Um, go up quite a bit. But I looked up uh, Colin Davis. I found another uh, record that he had autographed and it uh, sold for $25 recently. And uh, this is a version of Paradise Lost. And I've uh, got the date here somewhere. It says, uh, I think it was 1850 on that. And Sorry, 1835, uh, Paradise Lost and, uh, by Milton. So things to look for, condition on a book. Uh, if it has a nice leather binding and it's an older one, if it has uh, good uh, graphics in it, it's illustrated by a famous illustrator, it could be desirable. Main thing is if you have a first edition of the book, it uh, could, could be uh, very desirable. Even some more modern ones like um, Stephen King, uh, some of his books are pretty, could be worth a lot of money. And, uh, in this case, the book came out in 1669. So we're uh, almost 200 years from the first edition. And the, you can see it, the conditions a, a, a little... Uh, a little rough. So I'm thinking in a bookstore though, someone might like a nice readable copy of it and uh, probably maybe at $25 for that. And um, person wasn't sure the name on this one, um, but I, I it looked like um, Sabalos to me, C-E-B-A-L-L-O-S. And so I looked up a couple, uh, I found four Sabalos in my database and None seem to match the style of painting. So I think it's an unlisted artist, but, but this one um, ha- has a nice look to it. Uh, I, I think uh, nice decorative piece. And uh, I'm thinking it does, uh, $100 is a nice decorative painting. And he is um, a Hummel, uh, apple tree boy. And uh, f- fortunately, Hummel's uh, market has uh, dipped also. They, uh, 20 years ago, they were bringing much more money. So there's, they might sell for two or three, we might bring $100 at auction. Now, sometimes if I don't, we don't sell them at all, but if they, I see them in auctions and it's 10 to bring $100. Uh, so um, some, some things to look for though with a Hummel. Uh, the markings on the bottom. So, so this is, um, they, first they came out with a crown mark and then they had a, just a full B without that V on it. And this, so this is a little later mark. Other things you can see, it's got a little bit, they call that crazing, the cracking that you, you see on there. So it does affect the value, but again, they have um, dropped a bit. And I, re, I saw a recent uh, sales results for $80 for a, uh, pair. Um, so this one would be about 40. Okay. All right. So this is um, first in bird China. Okay. Got a better view of the mark there. And it said it's a pretty uh, extensive set service for eight. And again, China is one of the things where the markets uh, dipped uh, quite a bit. But so I saw I looked up uh, some recent sales of Furstenberg, and large sets like that were bringing from 100 to 250 dollars. And uh, this I think is the last one. So you get some decorative candlesticks, and they look to be um, more more contemporary. I think they have a nice uh, look, those. But and I think uh, maybe. $25 for the pair of those. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, please chime in. Uh, oh, I think some people are muted, but uh, we could definitely unmute you. Yeah, Lori, go ahead. Um, you were talking about advertising? Yes. Um, so would, would it be um, safe to say advertising crates and boxes um, are kind of holding their value? 
Yeah, they, they, they are. And it's more the advertising signs and uh, tin pieces. If you have a big um, old Coca-Cola tin sign, that's going to be worth a lot more. Yeah. But the, the crates, um, they may have some value, especially uh, depending on what they are and how old they are. If you have an old crate for Moxie from the yeah. 1920s, it's going to be more desirable than, than a, than a car, more current milk crate. Is, it seems like um, I, I have a large collection because that's my kind of thing that I like. Um, mm-hmm. But it seems like I, I can never find prices or comparable items. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And that's a good question. How do you find out what some, some of your things are worth? Um, yeah. you, you know, if you want to do some of this research on your own. And w- one of the things that I use a lot is um, eBay past selling prices. So if you go on eBay, they um Say, like say that Hummel lamp, um, someone could ask eight hundred dollars for it, and they're not even going to be in the ballpark, and that's the asking price. But if you look on uh, sold items, there's mm-hmm. a little button on the left, and you can see what things sold for you. So you can look up um, crates, and you may not find something exactly like exactly what you have, but you can find something similar. If if you if you really want to dig in deeper. There, um, you can look on, there's a company called Worth Point. And right. you, you yeah. can get a um, limited uh, su- a subscription for a short amount of time for get on there and get all your, uh, gather up all your things because I think for a day, it might, I, I don't know the price, but you can get one for a day. So if you gather up everything you want to find out, you spend that day on there and I think it'll be worth your while. Okay. Was Thank Worth you. Point the company that you did an interview with down south recently? Yeah, they partnered with them to do that uh, video on uh, the okay. states. So, yeah, they're they're a good company. There's uh, other websites that you can use as well for um, art. I use uh, one called Ask Art. So if you got a lot of paintings, you may want to sign up for that one. For you could probably again probably get a, 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 a subscription for a short time. Nice. Any other questions from people who are here today? We might be okay for now. Oh, I was we another one. Oh, we got a view. <laughs> okay, Do, are you, okay, we'll trade off. Um, I, I was curious what were the, what sort of trends you've seen over time and what's valuable or what people find interesting and what drove those trends? Uh, okay, so um, uh, one, one, one thing is um, gold, uh, gold estate jewelry right now selling for very well coins, gold and silver coins. And, and, and part of it is because the precious metals themselves are worth uh, so much that they, um, that the coins and the, the items made from them, the jewelry become uh, valuable. Um, I, 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 again, um, with collectibles, it's, it's, you do see some dipping as people age. I mentioned the uh, Hopalong Cassidy's kind of falling out of favor and that's a could be the same with automobiles. Uh, 1930s cars um, uh, dropped, may have dropped in value, but now the 60s and 70s cars are more desirable because there are still collectors um, maybe in their 60s who want ones from that era. So, um, um, but one of the biggest things I've seen is when I used to go to auctions 30 plus years ago, uh, nice used furniture, like we saw that uh, that nice cherry f- uh, furniture. And auctioneers used to bring that to the auction halls all the time. And like I mentioned, that you might get six hundred dollars for that set. But fortunately, that's all changed. And uh, yeah, glassware China dip, but but um, c- collectibles are still good. The baseball cards, comic books. We we recently had a uh, pretty rough uh, condition uh, ver. Hulk number one comic book from the sixties that brought $4,500 even in that wow. condition. So, <laughs> so but, um, your comic book, any comic books tucked away, uh, take a careful look through those. Lori, did you have another question as well? Yeah. I was just going to say, what if, what if you do um, have collections of things like uh, comic books, but you don't know, I, I have a large, I have a collection of comic books. I have a collection of dolls from when I was young. Yeah. What, what do you do with them? Just, just sit on them. Is it worth it to get an appraisal? How does, what do you do with the collections to make sure I, I guess you're covered? It depends on 
what your goal is, I guess, you know, maybe you want to get an appraisal if you, for insurance, especially uh, if some of these things turn out to be valuable. If you've got some of those uh, comps early, uh, especially superhero comic books, sixties mm-hmm. or earlier, uh, or some, some other items. Uh, the other thing, if you're looking to get an estimate, uh, you, if you're looking, considering selling them, you can do that as well. So it, I guess it depends on your goal. What, what do you, what do you, do you, do you look, you just want to know for your own interests or. Um, yeah. Just, just to know if, if some things are worth hanging on to, or if you should actually just sell it or. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that's uh that's a good, good question, but um can be a little hard to predict because uh, things change. Um, you you uh, never know. You, there's some things you can kind of predict. I've been seeing comic books, baseball cards hold up their value for a long time, but um, then uh, other things kind of, uh, then again, the metal prices go up and uh, all of a sudden that's um, thing. Those are worth more. So uh, things that um, toys that were made in Japan in the 1960s, 50s were tin toys were kind of considered junk uh, when they first came out, but then they got really popular, and as, this is dating back a little ways, but when Japan's economy really heated up, there were a lot of Japanese buyers looking to buy buy back some of those toys that were uh, got sent over to America. Also, uh, Chinese um, coin stamps, are the price has gone up as their economies improve. So it, is, it does t- kind of take a crystal ball to figure out what's going to be good in the future, but... Um, I, I guess the thing is, if you really like it, hang on to it. And but but if you're looking to get to see when might be the right time to sell, it, it, I think with some things like comic books, baseball cards, and this is might be as good a time as any to let them go. So, but it's just um, more of um, it, it's like picking a stock. You just, it's uh, you kind of there is some guess guessing or in, involved in it. Okay, thank you. I've got a quick question. Sure. Um, what is your favorite item, or maybe just the item that's like blown you away the most during an appraisal? Well, I, I um, got got to work for the Antiques Roadshow for right. one, one time back, but the thing that I did get to appraise was a pair of Elliot Ness's credentials, uh, <laughs> and and um, so they. Uh, uh, I try to you you pitch the, what you're uh, what you have to the producer, and so when I oh, pitched I it to the producer, the, uh, Dur- uh, Durgan Park, Park restaurant, restaurant, the second oldest restaurant in Boston, when it closed down, and that was um, an exciting auction to do. It was a lot of people had a lot of fond memories of uh, that that uh, restaurant, and it uh, there was a lot of local interest in that. And, all the local TV stations came in to check check it out and interview us, and um, it was kind of fun too. Yeah, I saw some articles about that auction. Wow, yeah. when did that open? The restaurant originally, do you know? Yeah, oh geez, I'm drawing a blank, but uh, it was the second oldest after the Oyster House. It was a couple hundred years old, and um, pretty good. It's kind of unfortunate. All right. I think uh, that might be it for now, but if you guys have any questions later on, or if anyone who's watching this uh, at a later date has questions, you can certainly reach Wayne at his website at centralmassauctions.com, or you can reach us at the Historical Society at uh, Thompson Historical Society at yahoo.com if you have any questions. Uh, And just thank you again so much to Wayne for bringing all of his expertise and for sort of reinventing the wheel for how an event like this is possible to do in 2020. Uh, And thanks so much to all of you for joining us. That was really nice of you to go through all the technological hurdles that it took to reach the meeting finally. But thank you so much for for, uh, spending the time with us. Thank you. Thank Thank you, you, Wayne. Thank you. Thank thank, thank all of you as well. Thank you, guys. Thank you, yeah. Let's see. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.